Dear Lord, bless our study. I thank You for these men that have gathered together. Thank You, God, for what You're doing in our lives. And we do pray, Father, that You'll be with the children's classes and the ladies and the prayers and all that we do. We can't pray too much, Lord. And we do pray You'll speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we have. this is part three of a study on raising manly sons. And uh, we're dealing with the feminizing effects of mishandled stress. And, uh, you know, the first message of this series set the foundation for why there is this need today there, in whatever generation you're living in. I mean, back in the first century when Paul said parents discipline their children, he said we've all had fathers that discipline a chase of chastise. I mean, that was a more masculine age. Uh, but even then he said you have to quit yourself like men. You had to exhort men, challenge them to rise up and be responsible and overcome and do what they need to do. But I showed as we have in other places in part one of this series, that there is a detailed, organized assault against especially boys. And the goal is to pervert them, to keep them from growing up, being responsible, courageous, bold, possessing all the masculine virtues, because those masculine virtues are a threat to powers that would rather them remain passive and controllable. In part two, we looked at how the environment, uh, plastic, uh, various things are feminizing by robbing boys of testosterone. We showed how it's not enough to just get BPA-free, that that's really a joke they're playing upon you. We showed the documentation that there's hundreds of uh, estrogenic substances in all plastic. And um, the hormone-free cheese, just because it's free of one hormone doesn't mean it's free of all the others they stick in there. So there's just so much deception that is going on. And we looked at that in detail last week. But um, I want to talk tonight about stress and how stress robs you of testosterone, robs your children. If your children are raised stressful, not knowing how to handle stress, They're going to be raised effeminately, without courage, without boldness. A few verses, Matthew 14, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Luke 6, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God, all night, in prayer to God. He sent the multitude away, and he went up into a mountain. What do you think is up in a mountain? Why did he go up into a mountain? Quiet. What else? What's that? Fresh air. Fresh air. <laughs> Amen. Probably always fresh back then to some degree. Away from the multitude, away from the cares of this life. Beautiful. Um, look at Luke chapter 8. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? They were in a state that they should not have been in as Christians. Stressed out. First Peter 5, casting how much of you care? All your care upon him. For He careth for you. It's good to know the Lord cares for us, isn't it? The 
The other morning as I turned in the Bible, I began reading about how Jesus went away up into a mountain to pray. You know, I, I don't like to just flip through the Bible and point and, and just... But, but nevertheless, I do know God can speak like that, can He not? I mean, God who controls everything and there is no chance. He says the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing of it is of the Lord. Certainly the Lord's going to uh, control. I, I don't want you to just flip open and try to just connect letters and, and words that don't mean anything. You know what I mean? And, but at the same time, I do believe God directs you. And, and, and as I looked at that verse and just began to see how he went up into a mountain, I thought of our vision for relocation and, and all of that. Uh, I certainly realize there's a time when you need to go and pray. But I felt there was something else that the Lord was showing me here. And I just thought about that. He went up into a mountain to pray. And I just thought about it. And I thought about it. And I said, Lord, something's here. I don't know what it is, but there's something here. You, you gave me that for a reason. It impacted me as I meditated upon it. On Wednesday afternoon, I took the family to the Cleburne Park, up there where that lake is, and we hiked a few miles. And uh, a lot easier now that Josiah is getting a little bigger, you know. And, and so um, some wild raccoons came and ate out of our hands. That was amazing, you know. Just what a wonderful little time for the children to have wild raccoons come and eat right out of their hand. And uh, Maybe you're not supposed to do that, but... <laughs> Anyway, it was... That's not on tape, is it? Anyway, I felt refreshed. Amen? And I remembered the feeling I had when we drove around a property in the Ozarks. And after I was there, a, uh, about half an hour, a strange feeling came upon me. And I turned to the realtor who lives in the Ozarks. I says, uh, Sir... Can I ask you a question? He said, yes. I said, what's this feeling that I'm feeling right now? He said, that would be relaxation. I said, wow. That's strange. It was later that I was reminded of the connection between stress and low testosterone. It's not slothfulness that we are seeking as men, but refreshment in all its forms. Think about that for a second. Refreshment. I, I don't want to move anywhere. Ozarks or stay here. I don't want to go anywhere and just sit around. You know what I'm saying? You know, they talk about coming up to a corner store and uh, seeing a few fellas playing checkers and coming back about five hours later and they're still sitting there playing checkers. I mean, if it's your day off or something, but uh, I don't want that mentality to come upon. I mean, we need to work. We need to get things done. And there's a difference between laziness and refreshment, isn't there? Do you think Jesus was being lazy when he went up in that mountain? No, I think he got more done. I think he was a model, an example for us. And I think it was necessary as a man to go up in that mountain and get refreshed. And one of the main ways is not only refresh that body, but spiritually, because he went up there to pray. And what an example he is to us that we need. If the Lord Jesus did this, how much more do we need these refreshing times to get away from it all and cast our cares upon God? Oh, I know we need it daily. But there are also seasons where you rest, you get refreshment. And it's not for the purpose of being weak, but so you can exert more effort, so you can be stronger. So my thesis is this. Prayer and faith are manly, resulting in healthy, healthy testosterone in men. Now, that's a perhaps a bizarre thesis. But everybody out there is talking about it, but they'll never just put their finger on it and say it. 
They're all saying stress robs you of testosterone. And then they're giving you research to document it. Well, okay. Then that means the Christian who knows the Lord and can cast his care upon the Lord, then that means the Christian's in a better situation than anybody to have the fullness of his strength. And so many people think prayer and a life of faith, that that's not manly. All these weightlifters and people out here, you know, good old boys and, and, and all these folks out here, you know, prayer, that's not manly. If they only knew all the stress they're carrying and how that stress is robbing them of their testosterone and all that makes them manly. Isn't that amazing? And the whole time, if you would cast your care upon God, you will get more done. Isn't that something? God, isn't it amazing that God made man to where if he'll take that time to cast his care upon him, it's not making him weak. He gets blessed. By getting that stress off of him, he gets strength to go to go work. It could probably, I'm not going to say probably, can get more done. Luther said it. He says, i got so much to do, I have to go pray. And, and early Christians have testified that I have to go pray because i got so much to do. I mean, certainly God controls everything. You need Him to work in your life. But who would have ever guessed that God had implanted in man that when he goes and prays and gets that stress off of him, he gets an increase of testosterone. He gets an increase of drive. He gets an increase of manliness. Everything changes and it makes him excited about getting things done and conquering things and not being depressed and discouraged. Wow. So the arguments to prove my thesis, number one, Jesus was a perfect man. He was not unmanly, was He? And Jesus prayed. So therefore, I believe that if you want to be the strongest that you can be, the fullness of masculinity, follow Jesus. Because He was the perfect man. And Jesus prayed. So really, that's enough for me. If we knew nothing else, that's enough. Pray so you can be manly like Jesus. But two, God calls us to quit ourselves like men and be strong. Yet He commands us to pray always and walk by faith. Prioritize our lives. Let our moderation be known unto all men. Be balanced. If God calls us to be manly, then He tells us over and over, pray, pray, pray. It must be that when you put two and two together, that prayer is not contrary to manliness, right? Right? I mean, if he's telling us pray always, lest you faint, faint has to do with discouragement and weakness, it sounds like what he's saying, be strong, pray so you can be strong. And I believe that that's not just spiritual strength. I believe that there is a blessing physically from praying. And number three, modern researchers have found a link between mishandled stress and lower testosterone levels. So it's not just the plastic of this age. It's not just the feminist teaching that's messing up the men. It's not just the lack of work and a lack of discipline and a lack of fathers in their life. All of that's true. But I'm going to tell you, we're living in a stressed out world. And that stress is not being handled by prayer and because it's not being handled by prayer and faith, it's just whatever little bit of testosterone they had left after that life of plastic, it's just getting rid of every bit. No wonder they're becoming a bunch of homosexuals. And if not, just lazy, passive, self-conscious, shy. So my conclusion is this. Prayer is not unmanly. Christians who walk by faith Casting their cares on God through prayer, with thanksgiving and confession of sin, with repentance and balance in their lives, will be less stressed and therefore stronger with higher testosterone levels and better health. Now, that says a lot, but I'm going to give you some documentation that uh, certainly would lead 
to this conclusion. Let's look at the situation today in Texas. Sitting in an English class in Irmo High School in 1983, just to give you an idea of Irmo High School in South Carolina, it was a pretty rich school, uh, at least in that area. But um, it was just in 2009 that the principal resigned for their having a first homosexual class. That's 2009. That wasn't that long ago. So uh, it remained a pretty good school by national standards. Anyway, I was sitting in English class um, in 1983 as I said goodbye to my classmates because I was moving to Texas. And so the teacher announced, you know, Joey's moving to Texas. And, and immediately these people began to shout out in my classroom. And they began to be saying, oh, that's sad. And I turned around and I said, why is that sad? You know, I don't want to leave, but, but why is that sad? And they said, people are obese in Texas. And then somebody else says, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And it went around the classroom that there's this obesity in Texas. And, and I thought that was a strange thing to say. You know what I mean? I was like, wow, that's kind of bizarre. And, um, and I'll be honest, when I came to Texas, I, I really saw what they were talking about. Uh, there was a contrast, at least at that time, the contrast was marked between the people. And uh, various magazines have continually in the past decade linked DFW and other Texas cities in the top ten list of the most obese and healthy cities in all of America. In 2010, and I don't endorse these magazines, I'm just looking on the web, reading headlines, and uh, so in 2010 I'm sure they have immodest pictures and things, new age stuff that we would not endorse here, but that's not my point. In 2010, men's fitness Arlington, Texas, ranked number two as the most unhealthiest city in all of America. San Antonio was number three. Where's that at? Texas. Fort Worth was number four. Where's that at? El Paso was number five. Where's that at? Dallas was number six. We got a little breather, and then Houston was number ten. But every year, no matter which magazine does it, you get at least four or five Texas cities in the top ten, and they might drop down to like number 18 or whatever. And I'm not saying this is some type of scientific... Uh, but nevertheless, here's what they're doing. They're counting the number of donut shops. And then they're looking at CDC statistics of, and that type of thing, and so they're getting a pretty good idea of you people are addicted to eating. I mean, you've never seen more all-you-can-eat restaurants, and we noticed that. I, I didn't know about any of these statistics, but... Uh, with my wife, when we drive to various conferences and preach and things, as I drove all around America, I looked at her and she looked at me and, and we said, you know, these other places don't have restaurants like Texas has. Everywhere you look, there's a fast food place in Texas. And uh, in 2009, Arlington was voted number one for the most fast food restaurants and donut shops in all of America. Couple. Now, you need to know this. You need to know the culture you're living in. The most fast food and donut shops coupled with obesity rates from the CDC. According to web reports, Jay Leno, a late night television talk show host, called attention to Arlington's number one award. Not a very good award. To show that at least not everyone was out of shape and unhealthy in Arlington, it is reported that Leno, Leno interviewed Brian Dobson. Brian Dobson founded Metroplex Gym in Arlington in 1987 because he was frustrated with the commercialization of the fitness industry. Metroplex Gym was recently rated the number one hardcore gym in America. Dobson has won over 50 bodybuilding, strongman, powerlifting events, along with state and national records. He is world record holder in several categories of drug-free weightlifting. He's also known for his discovery and training of eight-time Mr. Olympia, Ronnie Coleman, and many others. Dobson uses Metroflex Gym to help people overcome addictions and to witness the message of Jesus Christ. He catches his own fish, hands them out to the homeless. and So, by most standards, this is a pretty good fella, eh, man? Uh, might have some positive thinking and other things that he doesn't know about, but nevertheless, uh, a good fellow. I was amazed at the severity and degree of training these men would do when I joined in the late 80s, just for health reasons, you know. 
Uh, not like I was a big bodybuilder or anything, but uh, I wanted to be in shape. I wanted to be healthy. And so uh, I remember Dr. Uh, Mr. Dobson telling us one day that the body cannot endure this type of stress. Because you'd watch these men go in there and scream and holler and just, and there's no air conditioning. And, 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 and so they'd go in there and do all of these things. And, and, you know, and as I was walking in and looking, it, it was amazing to me. And he kind of shook his head and says, don't think that this is something that you can keep doing. And I said, well, what do you mean? You know, he's got all these trophies and pictures up on the wall. He says, the body can't handle it. And he says, so what happens is we've learned the hard way that over the long haul, your body begins to break down and you become old and it begins to eat your muscles. And it's called overstressing the body. Stress is known for lowering testosterone through the actions of cortisol. After researching this issue, I decided to ask Brian Dobson his views on the subject. He wrote me today and he says, Joey, cortisol to me is an enemy of anyone trying to get stronger and more muscular. Now, you think about that for just a second, and I'll build on it. Big causes are overtraining, so you get cortisol from overtraining, not enough sleep, and what? Stress. Imagine that in 2012. Not enough quality food, etc. Testosterone helps build muscle and recover. As we age, we lose testosterone and gain estrogen. To get great results from your workout, you must prioritize hard training, serious rest and recuperation, physically and mentally, plenty of, plenty of quality nutrition. Stay hardcore. God bless Brian Dobson. So becoming a world champion record holder in the deadlift may not be one of your goals. <laughs> but we should desire to be strong as men, all of us. Amen? So we can protect our families, do wholesome work, and walk in true manliness. We study the effects of plastic on testosterone levels, but chronic stress is also an enemy of a man's strength, his drive, and his rigor. As Bible-believing Christians, we are more equipped through prayer and faith, a balance, and diet to combat this chronic stress. We have many benefits that unbelievers do not possess and enjoy. So far, we're learning that Chronic stress zaps your testosterone, zaps your strength, makes you weaker. But we have benefits of the Lord, don't we? Hey, you know one of the places, one of your greatest sources of stress, you say it's my word, but hold on, that, that too. But one of your greatest sources of stress today is guilt. 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 Most Americans are on antidepressants today because of guilt. Guilt brings stress. And what does stress do? Makes you weak, robs you of your testosterone. Now, we got benefits in the Lord, right? Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. What does it tell you to do? Forget not all His benefits. That's the first one. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. When you get saved, you get your sins forgiven eternally, but you got to daily get cleansing. Amen? So what happens if you walk around with that guilt? You're doing things you shouldn't do, and then instead of confessing it to the Lord and forsaking it, you just walk around with it. Hey, if you're not confessing your sins and getting them off of you through the blood of Christ, through prayer, I don't care how big and strong you think you are, I tell you what, it's robbing you. It's robbing you of your strength. Guilt will rob you of your strength. Who healeth all thy diseases. I think he puts those two together because when you walk around with guilt, what's it going to bring? It's going to bring physical problems. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. So he gives you good food to eat, tells you a biblical diet, uh, so you know how to eat right. And I tell you what, when you eat those foods that end up uh, blessing you, anti-inflammatory foods, the nourishment that's found in them, I tell you what, it's a good thing. Amen? You end up getting your guilt off of you. And so now you have that uh, cheerful spirit, stress-free living. You're eating right. And it says right here, your youth is renewed like the eagles. So certainly much of the chronic stress afflicting millions of Americans and robbing them of their manliness and strength is due to guilt from sin. 
sins of commission and sins of omission. By trusting Christ, praying daily in faith, and confessing our sins and forsaking them, we may have our countenances lifted. As God promised Cain, He said, if you'll do what's right, you'll have your countenance lifted. There's much evidence that this life of faith also has physiological effects. It says in Proverbs 17, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit does what? Dry up the bones. That's not sorrow because of your sin. Well, it could be a sorrow of unconfessed sin. A broken spirit, this depression that comes because you're walking around in guilt, it affects your bones. It makes your bones rot. Does that sound like you're strong if you got dry, brittle bones that break? That doesn't sound like you're very strong, does it? And the Bible says, a merry heart doeth good like a... So you know what weightlifters are doing around this country? They're trying to positive think themselves into a happy spirit. Is that going to work? No, because your conscience, no. You can tell yourself a million times, I'm beautiful, I'm wonderful, there is no problem. But you know what? Your conscience knows. So it's the Christian who confesses his sin that can have the greatest health and the greatest strength. Putting this all together, we can conclude that anything that robs us of true Christian joy, like sin, bad associations, dwelling on evil, walking by sight, and not praying, will also rob us of physical strength. Notice what I said. Anything that robs you of true Christian joy can also rob you of physical strength. Scientifically, it will increase cortisol, lower testosterone, and bring sorrow. And This is what they're discovering. All these researchers are discovering after all this time, they're realizing, wow, what we do with the mind affects our body in many ways. But the psychologists don't have an answer, do they? Oh, you better believe the pharmaceutical companies are trying to jump into this whole game, you know. But here's what they know. When you are walking with that guilt, your cortisol increases, your testosterone lowers, and it's going to lead to bad health and weakness. And what did Nehemiah tell us? It puts a whole new view upon neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I know that's spiritual strength, emotional strength. But what if physical strength is in there too? The joy of the Lord makes you strong. The joy, praying and confessing your sin puts testosterone in you or whatever else that the Lord does and you end up physically stronger than you would have been. Notice the following research in light of all of this. Dan Gwartney, MD, in the Testosterone Cortisol Connection, 2009, says high cortisol levels tend to break down to a breakdown of muscle. Loss of lean mass and strength. Okay? That's why Brian Donovan said it is an enemy. Exercise. When performed as a suitable intensity, at a suitable intensity and volume, can increase the anabolic stimulus, resulting in stronger and larger muscles. However, as many have discovered the hard way, exercising to excess can result in a weakened catabolic state known as the overtraining syndrome. Numerous examples exist in the scientific literature confirming the moderate volume, high-intensity training can increase testosterone, resulting in improved exercise performance. Persisting in the overtrained state often leads to impaired long-term performance. Now, what are you doing? What are you bringing? When you exercise, you get stressed, right? But if you overdo it, then you're leading to chronic stress, and you're getting the same situation you'd have if you got a credit card or whatever else and you're in debt. You just have that stress that's upon you. And persisting in this overtrained state leads to impaired long-term performance muscle loss, and decreased mental function. It even affects your mind. The body appears to be able to recover from excess exercise with what? Rest. As people grow older, testosterone levels fall, 
and cortisol levels rise. Clearly, there are many physical consequences when cortisol levels are high, especially in the setting of low testosterone. Secondarily, there also appears to be negative mental effects to having high cortisol levels. Severe depression is associated with high cortisol levels. High cortisol levels interfere with information processing, making it more difficult to think or make decisions. High levels of stress hormone cortisol play a critical role in blocking testosterone's influence on competition and domination. This is from University of Texas Education 2010. High levels of stress hormone cortisol play a critical role in blocking testosterone's influence on competition and domination. The study led by Robert Joseph, the University of Texas at Austin, is the first to show that the two hormones, testosterone and cortisol, jointly regulate dominance. The findings available online in hormones and behavior show that when cortisol, a hormone released in the body in response to threat, increases, the body is mobilized to escape danger rather than respond to any influence that testosterone is having on behavior. Among those who lost in these games they set up, 100% of the subjects with high testosterone and low cortisol requested a rematch to capture their lost status. However, 100% of participants with high testosterone and high cortisol declined to compete again. According to research, Chronically elevated cortisol levels can impair fertility by inhibiting testosterone production in men. And women, chronically high levels of cortisol can produce severe fertility problems and result in an abnormal cycle. These effects of cortisol in both men and women are reversed when stress levels go down. What they're saying is this. Stress that's not handled right, that is repeated and continued for a long time, raises these cortisol levels and it leads to all types of complications. And uh, that's what they believe is going on physiologically. I read this book, The Cortisol Connection. It looks like there's a lot here, but you ought to see how much I deleted from the book to give you just the uh, basics of the book, The Cortisol Connection. Uh, our bodies, including our nervous systems and endocrine hormonal systems, are simply not meant for the unique stresses that we face as part of our everyday life in the 21st century. Now, you go back, they had a hard time. There was martyrdoms, I meant all kinds of things going on. But there's some strange, just differences today uh, in this modern life, taking man away from the way that God designed him to live in so many ways uh, is destroying man. Uh, the series of daily events that I refer to as the 21st century syndrome leads most of us to experience a state of perpetual stress, that familiar feeling of always being on and rushed and harried and frantic. Depression and anxiety in our society is now ten times higher than it was just a generation ago. In one study conducted by researchers at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, individuals with higher levels of money stress had higher cortisol levels. If we experience stressful events on a regular basis or unable, are unable to effectively rid ourselves of the stressor, our cortisol or hydrocortisone levels stay constantly elevated above normal levels. So you've got this fight or flight mode that is cortisol in your body with adrenaline. And it's there for a reason. But when it stays up, then it destroys the body and robs the muscles and begins to drain the body. I mean, it's one thing to run from a lion, but you're not meant every day to run from a lion, or every five minutes run from a lion. Something's wrong, you know. It begins to tear you down. Elevated cortisol levels make you fat, kill your drive, shrink your brain, squelch your immune system, and generally make you feel terrible. Well, that's why they find out when Christians go to church two times a week and pray, they, they're happier and they're healthier physically. A lot of it could be you got these cortisol levels that are constantly in you that aren't being dealt with, and it's destroying people. Cortisol is not a purely toxic substance. You know, there's obviously a reason for it. Although in most cases, too much of it certainly wrecks havoc, bodily havoc. The whole point here is balance. 
keeping cortisol levels from falling too low or rising too high. Just as you don't want cortisol levels to rise too high, neither do you want them to drop too low. Think again about the fight or flight mechanism. The human body ramps up production of cortisol. The long-term effect is fat gain. If it continues for any prolonged period of time, a significant amount of muscle mass may be lost. This is why they're putting out all those headlines talking about stress makes you gain weight. And you're sitting here eating and you're trying not to eat very much, but you're gaining weight and you got all that stress, you know. No, uh, there's no justification for it at all. But the pot belly pastor, there might be a reason for that, all right? And then we need to figure out why. And maybe he needs to pray more. Maybe he needs to exercise more. There's a lot of things we can do to relieve this cortisol. But any high press, high pressure, stress situation, if it's not being dealt with right, can lead to detrimental effects, you know. Think about that in our lives today. Scientific, oh, if it continues for any pro prolonged period of time, a significant amount of muscle mass may be lost. So if you say, I won't fight or flight, no, it's going to begin to steal from your muscles and end up. Uh, Scientific research and medical evidence clearly show that a sustained high level of cortisol triggered by chronic, unrelenting stress results in an increase in appetite and cravings for certain foods. You feel hungry almost all the time. A powerful synthetic form of cortisol is used as a drug, a prednisone, etc., with bad effects in the long term. So imagine putting this stuff into your body. Greek researchers have shown us that well-trained athletes have high cortisol during their workouts but that those levels fall back to normal during rest. And that's what it's supposed to do. You're supposed to get that rest where it drops back down. That testosterone comes in, builds your muscle, builds your strength, and that's what it's supposed to do. You stress it out, and then you're supposed to rest. But overtrained athletes who are overstressed, on the other hand, have low levels of cortisol during exercise, but high levels during their rest, indicating that their bodies are still under that stress, perhaps from injury or infection or inadequate recovery from adaption to training. They also experience fatigue. We do not want cortisol to be chronically anything, high or low or medium, but rather we want cortisol flux. We want a highly responsive, finely tuned pattern of cortisol activity where levels do not remain moderate, but they actually go up during exercise or important deadlines and fall during rest and recovery. Rest and recovery, that's what we need. Even Jesus left the multitude. He left some people that needed to be healed. you know that? He left them all and went up in that mountain and prayed. When the brain perceives a stressful event, it responds by stimulating endocrine glands throughout the body to release hormones, increasing, including both adrenaline and cortisol. Adrenaline is responsible for the up feeling that causes excitement, while cortisol is responsible for modulating the way our bodies use various fuel sources. Cortisol increases levels of blood sugar or glucose. So it puts that sugar so you can take off running and get out of there. The body's initial response to a perceived acute stressor is the already mentioned fight or flight response. Levels of adrenaline and cortisol increase, while levels of DHEA and testosterone decrease, leading to muscle loss, anxiety and nervousness and headaches and heartburn and irritability. As the acute stressor becomes more of a chronic stressor, cortisol levels continue to increase and testosterone levels continue to decrease. The more stress, the lower testosterone. Having detrimental effects on bone and other tissues. And what did we just read in the Bible? They don't even know this stuff's right here in the Bible. Bringing fatigue, fluctuations in blood sugar, increased appetite, carbohydrate cravings, muscle weakness, and reduced immune system function. Stress that's not relieved, that's continued. There's stress in the family. Children get sick. One reason might be there might not be a bug or flu. It just might be all that stress led to high cortisol levels, lowered their testosterone, and now they can't fight infections. Ohio University scientists have suggested that the nature of our modern society often makes chronic stress inescapable. Well, how much more reason 20th century, 21st century Americans need to pray, go to church, spend time with God, spend time with the children, have that quiet time. More hassles lead to more cortisol. Exercise will be your best hedge against acute stress slipping into the realm of chronic stress. In one study, military recruits were subjected to five days of extreme exercise, starvation, and sleep deprivation. 
Not surprisingly, due to the stressful nature of this training, cortisol levels went up and performance deteriorated. The researchers also found that even after five days of rest and refueling, cortisol levels still had not returned to normal. Uh, that, that's why you can go on vacation and, or, or drive over to the Ozarks somewhere and look at property, and for the first few days, you still haven't relaxed. But all of a sudden, right when you're about ready to come home, for the first time, you're like, wow, I think I'm starting to relax finally. Well, too late. Vacation's over. That's not good, is it? Five days later, they were still had those high fight-or-flight levels in their body. Um, demonstrating the fact that no matter how tough and stress-resistant you think you may be, even you have a breaking point. Stress levels among female high-stress factory workers tended to either remain the same or even increase when they left work. What does that do for the woman who's working two jobs today, trying to be a mama? It's not natural. It's not right. And no wonder she's having all types of complications and problems. What's that, brother? very stressful situation and she just went crazy she wow. came into work and lost it uh, like, like big time she, she had, I don't know what happened but she, she's out until Tuesday doctors noticed mm. that's why you do not want to put them in high places like that that's not good a phenomenon known as overtraining has been linked to chronic cortisol exposure. For those who missed it, stress makes cortisol levels go up. In fight or flight situations, cortisol secretion releases amino acids from your muscle, glucose from your liver, and fatty acids from your tissue into the bloodstream for use as energy. With today's fast-paced fast food habits, it would be surprising to find people who did not experience elevated cortisol levels on a regular basis. So what, you say? You're not afraid of no stinking cortisol. Well, you should be. Whenever our bodies are exposed to a stressor, cortisol springs into action to increase levels of fat and sugar in the bloodstream, which can be used by the brain and muscles to deal with the stressor. Normally, cortisol levels are quickly depleted following the stress response. Unfortunately, the way our bodies were designed to deal with stress, fight or flight, is not the way we deal with stress in our modern world. During periods of high cortisol production, stress, our natural production of testosterone falls. From the perspective of achieving peak physical and mental performance, you want to have a relatively low cortisol level and a relatively high testosterone level. Researchers in Denmark have confirmed the heart damaging effects of stress by showing that increased cortisol and reduced testosterone are independently related to an increase in blood vessel thickening, a significant risk, risk factor for heart disease. Physiology researchers from the University of North Carolina have shown a clear negative relationship between cortisol levels and testosterone levels in athletes, meaning that as stress gets higher, cortisol goes up and testosterone drops. Researchers from the University of Connecticut have shown that overtrained athletes have elevated levels of SHBG, which binds testosterone, making it unavailable to the body, and reduced testosterone levels, resulting in a person becoming depressed or at least moody. Preventative medicine, so you don't want this stress. You might as well drink from a whole bunch of plastic. If you have this stress and you're not dealing with it through prayer, you're walking around irritable and moody, and there's more going on. It's in the physical realm as well as in the spiritual. God curses you in the physical for what we're neglecting in the spiritual. It's amazing. Preventative medicine specialists from the University of California at San Diego have shown that high levels of stress lead to lower testosterone levels. Men who have low levels of testosterone are more likely to suffer from depression. Keeping cortisol low and testosterone high really means maintaining optimal values in the face of stress and aging. In terms of physical activity, we know that virtually all forms of exercise help to elevate testosterone levels. Endurance exercise works almost as well as lifting weights for maintaining testosterone in most moderate exercisers. Researchers at the University of Texas have shown that not only does inactivity lead to a rapid loss of muscle mass, but when accompanied by high levels of stress and cortisol, muscle loss is accelerated. So you're not working hard physically, you're not even exercising, 
but you've got all the stress and all these problems, and you say, I'm just too busy, I'm too stressed to work out. Well, well now you, you've got a double problem here as it begins to just decrease your strength and your muscle size. Researchers from the University of Connecticut's Human Performance Laboratory demonstrated that cortisol levels were increased by dehydration. So, exercise and drink fluids. Don't drown yourself, but definitely drink. You're made to drink. Finally, stress researchers from around the world have shown that how we perceive and cope with a given stressor can deter... Don't drink fluoride. Don't drink BPA water, but nevertheless, let's drink and wash away toxins. How we perceive and cope with a given stressor can determine our hormonal response to that stressor. This means you can be exposed to stress and deal with it appropriately, resulting in only a temporary healthy rise in cortisol levels. That's how it's supposed to be. However, if the stress is dealt with inappropriately, your cortisol levels rise and testosterone levels fall. More important than winning or losing is the coping pattern you display. So you teach these children, relating this to young... You get out of here and you get a kickball game, and all of a sudden, one little boy, he's not even over there. He's not a team player. Everybody went out to play kickball, but he's over there uh, throwing rocks at a tree. It's like, what are you doing, boy? You know, teach him how to be a team player. Everybody came out to play kickball? Come play kickball. And, but then he gets over here, and he's playing kickball, and he loses. So now he's whining, and he's over here by the tree sulking, and he's upset. And he has this high stress. Some of them turn red and get angry. Teaching them how to dip. Sure, we want to win. That's great. But more importantly, we want to teach you how to be a godly person and how to deal with things and how to deal with the stress of losing. That's part of life. But if you're not going to deal with the stress of losing, you're not going to cope, you're going to end up losing your testosterone. Which is why the classic effeminate person gets upset when he loses if he doesn't get chosen, he whines. If his children don't get chosen, he throws a fit. He whines. And they're effeminate people. They're lacking in testosterone, you see. And it's physiological. Because they don't deal with stress right, it robs them and makes them womanly. So now you know a bit about how chronic stress leads to elevated cortisol and reduced testosterone levels in the body. Stress makes you burn fewer calories and consume more food, especially carbohydrates. Results from animal studies, Department of Neurosciences at New Jersey Medical School, showed that even moderate levels of daily unpredictable stress over the course of five weeks led to increased levels of cortisol and increased appetite. Researchers at the University of Colorado have shown that athletes performing too much exercise, overtrained cross-country skiers, for example, experience the very same adverse effects of elevated cortisol levels, such as mood disturbances, immune system suppression. A particular interest in this study was the finding that the athletes who were working out the most, those putting in the highest mileage and the longest training time, were also the ones with the highest cortisol levels, the highest body fat levels, and more depression. Insomnia and fatigue often combined with each other in a vicious cycle. This is not to say that aerobic exercise, such as jogging or cycling, is bad for you. It emphasizes the fact that extremes of exercise with inadequate recovery are perceived by the body as stressors. Swedish researchers have found chronic stress to increase the occurrence of yeast infection and other infections. A consequence likely to... So, so how many women are getting uh, affected? How many men are getting infected? How many children are getting physical problems? And it's stress-related. It's stress. The very fact, oh sure, there's all kinds of things in the air all the time. But stress, there's no prayer in the home. There's no singing. There's no family. How was your day? Hearts turning to the children of, of the father. There's, there's yelling. There, there's bad attitudes. There, there's whining and, and, and talking about people behind their back. You've got a high stress home. Yelling at the children in rude ways, and, and there's never talking to them in, in good way. And so there's this high stress, then all of a sudden an infection comes by and your children succumb to it. And you look for somebody to blame. But maybe it's the stress situation of your own home.
Practice such as, practices such as eating a balanced diet, getting adequate rest, performing some regular exercise can do wonders for helping the body adapt and respond to stressful events. Unfortunately, stress often causes us to do just the opposite. You eat junk food. You're stressed, so you want to stop at the fast food place, you know. You can't seem to relax, and we have no time for exercise. You can't pray. You're too stressed. each of which only serves to compound the problem and exasperate the detrimental effects of stress on our body. Technology, mostly those items like cell phones, blackberries, email, enable us to be working anywhere and everywhere, and unfortunately all the time. You know, you have a little fellowship and somebody's on their cell phone, talking to somebody that's many miles away and reading some little text thing, and, and you're never around the people that you're around. You're always around somebody else. And uh, I know some of that might be necessary. But that which isn't necessary, I think, is increasing stress in our life. And, and uh, it's a mess. I, I, I'm starting to think that the folks that know when to leave the cell phone behind are the ones that are getting most done. Because they're getting that recuperation time, that rejuvenation of the mind and things. And it's just some things to think about for you. Because this relates to our whole vision of going to the Ozark, escaping some of this rat race that we see here. We don't want to go there and go to sleep. We don't want to go there and be lazy. But our point is um, we need to think about some of these things, the degree that modern technology is making us weaker, not stronger. Whenever possible, leave the cell phone behind. Pray. Research on religion at Arizona State University has shown that people who are more spiritual and pray more often have lower cortisol levels and lower blood pressure. Stress researchers in Arizona have shown that being more fit is protective against stress and against the age-related rise in cortisol levels. Now, in looking at all of this, my first question was, well, there you go. If stress that is not dealt with properly if you are kept in a constant fight-or-flight mode, raises cortisol, lowering testosterone, then what about people that suck down caffeine all day? They're getting a constant adrenal response, which means they're getting a constant rise in cortisol to keep them in that fight-or-flight mode, which they're getting high off of, but it's really stressing them out, and it's lowering their testosterone. They have no drive to do anything without the caffeine because the only way they know how to get anything done is fight or flight cortisol, not testosterone because they don't have any. They depleted all their testosterone. And so he does go on to say, as little as two to three cups of coffee will elevate cortisol levels. Well, of course. If anything you said is true, then, then this has to be. Caffeine is effeminate. See, I like to, I like to put... What they're afraid to say, I like to just go ahead and say. Caffeine makes you effeminate. So, well, I need it to get dry. Well, you're supposed to get dry from being a man. You're supposed to go out and get things done and conquer and take care of things. You're supposed to get that from being a man. So, I don't have any of that left. So, I have to use caffeine. Well, that's going to just destroy what's left of your body and, and, and manliness. It's already destroyed. These researchers can often identify problems, but they're usually blind when it comes to true remedies. You know, he leads you up to this building point, and then you're waiting to say, okay, what do we do? And, and now he did mention exercise, and he did mention pray. I'll give him that. But it's not just any prayer, you know. Uh, you can't just invent a God and go pray to Him. That's not going to help your conscience. You need the true God. You need the Holy Spirit. But they don't have the answers that we have because we're Christian. So as we identify these problems and see how it confirms the Bible, we've got to turn to Jesus Christ and His wisdom in how to fix these problems. How does the Bible say deal with stress? We, we don't need all... Well, number one, it says prioritize your life, does it not? Have your work in the right place. Have your family in the right place. Have your church in the right place. You don't want stress from any side. You know what I mean? Try, try to get everything balanced. And 
Have that prayer time. Have that play with children time. Have that rest time. Have that exercise time. Have that workout and sweating of the body. And, and, and believe me, you know, I heard y'all debating about weights and, and that type of thing. I, I don't want to get into that right now, but I will say this. Never use exercise to replace work. See, I, I think it ought to be extra credit. I think it ought to be on top of the work. But if work's being left done and we're working out, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good. But, but I think if, if we're working and we're getting things done and there's certain things that we want to work out, praise God for that. It increases testosterone and helps you work more. Amen? But our goal ought to be more work, right? It ought to be more productivity. And I think all of you agree with that, that our goal is to work and be manly and any working out is for that purpose that we might be more manly and, and do more work, right? But God forbid that you end up with a whole church of, uh, of weightlifters and martial art folks and all this stuff, and you end up with a whole church, but no work can ever get done. I'm too busy working out. I'm too busy. I've got to go to my karate or wherever you go to. We've got to have something done, amen? All right. Uh, listen to what he says. Rather than focusing most of my efforts on preaching to you about something that I know you'll probably ignore. So he says, there's all kinds of ways that I could preach to you to get rid of your stress, but I'm not going to deal with those levels. Well, that's what I'm going to do, see. So, this is why these folks that write these books in pop culture, they can't really give you any answer. Because they say, if you start preaching, people will turn you off. Well, some people need to be preached to, do they not? Listen to what he says. He says, we can begin to fix this without having to sacrifice your current lifestyle or become a monk. Now, wait just a second. I don't want you to become a monk. I want you to be a Christian, a godly, masculine, manly Christian. It has nothing to do with being a monk. But he's going to try to fix this without sacrificing your current lifestyle. What he says is they're not going to change. He said, what Americans need to do is they need to get rid of their TVs, get rid of their cell phones, get rid of their coffee, get rid of all this stuff. You know, we might suggest bringing the wife home, uh, uh, downsizing, you know, getting out of debt, get, getting all this stuff that's bringing stress in your life, but getting out of the fast food restaurant, all these things. But what they're doing is they're trying to write to Americans who they know will not accept the real answers and how to fix their life. Isn't this a sorry state of things? That's like pastors I've met. I said, well, you know the answer. Why don't you, why don't you tell them? He said, they won't do it. So, see, we're living in a defeat age, are we not? It's a defeatist mindset. It's like they're not going to do it. So why even bother? Try to give them a pill to take. They'll take a pill. He, he suggests some supplements that you might take. He goes and tries to give you some supplements. He says, because that's all you're going to do is just take a few supplements. You'll take a pill. But, but you won't exercise. You won't stay out of the fast food joint. You won't give up your coffee. You won't pray. You know. I'm just trying to speak to you from the viewpoint of these people that are writing these books. And probably if he was sitting here talking to me, he would say, well, after all these years of preaching, how many, how many folks have you got to pray? How many folks show up for a prayer, prayer meeting at your church? You know, how many, except, how many folks stay out of the fast food restaurant? You've been preaching all these years, you know. You're known as a health food pastor. How many folks in your church do you have? You know, and there is some truth to what Jeremiah says when God tells them, He says, tell them, call them to the old path. Call them to change and amend their way. But the people said, we would not. We will not. But God wanted to give you rest. He had the answer for you. He wanted to give you refreshment and blessing and healing and strength and everything you need. But the people said, no, no thank you. In conclusion, we see that chronic stress, stress that continues and is not handled properly, lowers testosterone. As we evaluate our prayer lives and our state of faith, we should also examine the degree that bad music is robbing us of strength. This is what I do. This is how my mind works. I sit down and I say, now, okay, let me sit here for a second and let me think. High stress is leading to lower testosterone, lower drive, lower strength, high cortisol levels. If I don't pray, I'm going to have stress. 
So I'm going to be weaker as a man. I'm going to get less done. Not only I'm not going to have God's help, you know what I mean? It's, it, you're not just praying as a exercise. It's a real God, a real Lord, a real person you're praying to. But then I start thinking this way. What about those stresses in our life that don't have to be there? That people are putting in their lives like bad music. So they're walking around in a state of high stress from movies and music and soundtracks and things. What is that doing? I believe it's decreasing our strength and raising cortisol levels. So I begin to look around and here's Roger W. Wick, Ph.D., Herbalist Review, 2002, Effects of Music and Sound on Human Health. He says, uh, this is some interesting stuff. He says, Oswald Spengler, in his history text, Decline of the West, devoted several chapters to the role of art. Y'all still awake? Several chapters to the role of art and music in the stability of civilizations. He predicted that based on the popularity of extreme romanticism and excessive sentimentality, that's what happened in the late 1800s, dissonance and 12-tone compositional styles in music of the early 20th century Europe, Western civilization was fated to decline, even as its technical and scientific wizardry promised great wonders. So this fella decided that based on the music that we finally reached the decline of our civilization. One can only surmise that had Spangler lived to witness punk rock, heavy metal, techno, and rap music in the context of late 20th century America, he would have become even more convinced of his theory's correctness. And I was really shocked to begin to read these heavy metal writer, uh, singers and, and, and have them begin to say the heart of heavy metal music is bisexuality. I was in shock. I'm like, what? All that aggression and everything and the heart of it is homosexuality? What in the world's going on here? People living in modern industrialized nations have learned through painful experience that many of the wonders of technology have deadly side effects. Plastics that promise to make our lives convenient are now recognized to be a major source of potent and dangerous hormone disrupting chemicals. Excessive television viewing is now being recognized as a factor in learning and behavior disorders in children. You know, it's all coming out physiologically. It's all coming out in these studies. A television disrupts their mind, disrupts their brain, slows their speech, etc. I've documented all of that for you. But here's what he asked. Could it be possible that just as plastic we thought was great, but it ends up messing you up, TV you thought was this great, wonderful thing, and it robs your children of being able to speak, being able to think, could it be that music, modern music, that we think is so wonderful, is actually having some detrimental effects? Could it be possible that music, which many of us take for granted as benign background noise, could have unrecognized effects, both harmful and beneficial? The Mozart effect, we've studied that for years, is based on research by Francis Rocher, who determined that listening to 10 minutes of Mozart's sonata briefly increased scores 48% relative to control groups. And Mozart was a step out of Baroque into classical, and they're still getting good results from it, you know. Once you take the next step into Romanticism, then you're in a mess, you know. It's hard for me to even listen to it. Other researchers have demonstrated that compositions of other classical composers, such as Bach, show similar benefits. Of course they do. Bulgarian psychologist Lozanov found that playing Baroque instrumental music, such as that of Handel and Bach, in the background while teaching foreign language vocabulary greatly increased students' speed of learning and degree of memory. Physicist Harvey Bird and neurobiologist Schreckenberg subjected different groups of mice to the sound of traditional voodoo drumming, to Strauss waltzes, and to silence, and then tested each group's ability to navigate through a maze to get food. All music was played continuously at low volumes to eliminate possible behavioral effects from loud sounds generally. So they wanted just the music, not the loud sound. The voodoo group performed progressively worse over the period of time they were exposed to the music and eventually became so disoriented that they became unable to complete the maze at all. These mice were also hyperactive and aggressive, often engaging in cannibalistic behavior. Well, that sure sounds like where our society is, isn't it? I mean, they might not be eating. One. Well, well, some of them are. But everybody might not be succumbing to cannibalism, but you have disordered chaos, do you not? 
One also might wonder whether certain types of agitating music, such as rock or heavy metal, may induce excessive cortisol over extended periods of time and become addictive, like caffeine. In a similar manner to the adrenal rush one gets from coffee. There it is. Mozart's music sonata for two pianos has been shown to reduce total seizure activity in epileptic patients by 65%. So, I think what they're discovering is music matters. Music affects your body. Music affects your strength. And, you know, I, walk, I, I had to leave a gym. You know, not only are gyms immodest and, uh, uh, and that type of thing, but the music that they play is so against anything related to strength, you know. It, it's just the opposite of strength. And uh, once you understand these things and you go there and you're trying to do strength training or something and they're playing that stuff, it, it's just, uh, I don't know how they do it. But they, they must just numb their minds to it. Norman M. Weinberger in The Musical Hormone says, Hormonal control by music seems clear. So you're definitely getting a, a, a reaction in your hormones from the type of music you listen to. Although one might not want to consider whether they are overdosing on cortisol, it might be prudent to give this some serious thought. In other words, the music is disordering you, placing you in a fight-or-flight mode just like coffee does. And you think, but it's, but it's, it's generating, it, it, you know, I'm getting things accomplished. It's motivating me. Yeah, motivating you like coffee, but not motivating you like testosterone motivates you. Not motivating you the way you need to be motivated. So, these are things to consider. My ultimate verse for you is Philippians chapter 4. Be careful for what? Be careful for nothing. But in everything... By prayer and supplication, that's where you cry out to God with what? Thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And he goes on to tell you, think upon those things that are true. Think upon those things that are praiseworthy. Surround yourself with those. And he says, a peace of God will come upon you which passeth all understanding and will keep your hearts and your minds. And, oh, I have to believe that even though God may not mention it right there, I have to believe that God also sends you strength to your body. Because it says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. The man who prays regularly calls out to God, reminding himself of all that he has to be thankful and tells God what he's thankful for. Just the stress, God, it's not my problem, it's yours. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for the mess I've made. Whatever you've done wrong, tell God about it and forsake it. Confess it to Him. If you've been foolish, don't try to cover it up. Don't try to make excuses. Don't try to justify yourself. Uh, don't try to get out of it. Uh, tell God plainly what you did wrong. Come clean with Him because He knows anyway. And the sooner you tell Him, the better. And go to God. Confess your sin. Give Him that thanksgiving and ask God to help your situation. It's not a waste of time. The wicked say it's vain to pray. But as a Bible-believing Christian, we have to believe it's not vain. It does profit to pray unto God. And I'm just telling you today, I've preached this for years, all I'm adding to it is simply, not only will it bless you spiritually and emotionally and it'll get things accomplished for you to go to God, I'm just adding to it, it'll make you strong. So really, when we go back to thinking about this, praise God for hard work, praise God for working out with weights and all you do, but if you want increased testosterone levels, then get down on your knees and pray and get rid of some of that cortisol that's in your life and increase that testosterone, and I bet you you'll get up with some drive and get some things done. That's what I think. Amen? So if we're going to raise manly sons, the conclusion of the matter is, let's teach them, teach them, how to deal with stress, how to come clean with God, how to pray daily, and how to give everything to the Lord regularly and casting that care upon Him. And um, not only that, listening to good music, quality, good, godly music, not surrounding their lives within video games and that high stress that's in all of that and, and all that television watching and soundtracks of explosions so they can keep you glued to the television, which no wonder these children are so messed up, losing all their testosterone every time they sit and watch one of those things, you know? All right, I'm done. Any comments? Questions?